Hello, everyone. Today, today we'll continue to learn together Guru Yoga. Today we are looking starting from page six of the liturgy. From the ever turning Dharma wheel in his right hand falls flows a rain of Dharma on the entire universe. When we're visualizing in the Guru Yoga part, yesterday we've talked about how our mind is clarity and emptiness. And that is the Dharmakaya. So based on that, Rikha, we visualize the form of the Guru. So from the Dharmakaya form, for those capabilities that are a little bit lower will be seeing the Namanakaya form and those who are a little bit higher will be Sambhogakaya, Sambhogakaya. So for Dharmakaya, there is no form. And yesterday when we talked about the visualization, we talked about how the form of the guru should be like, his facial expression, um, what kinds of clothes he's wearing. We've already talked about all of that yesterday. Today, we're talking about how he is holding in his right hand the ever-turning Dharma wheel. Why is it that the guru is ever-turning the Dharma wheel? What it symbolizes is The strength of compassion from Dhammakaya is used to liberate sentient beings. And to liberate sentient beings, he manifests in different forms. You'll see that Gachin Rinpoche is often also turning the wheel, the Dharma wheel. We know that and we often see it too. So when he turns the Dharma wheel, he's able to benefit countless sentient beings. In turning the Dharma wheel, all the merit will be dedicated to all the sentient beings, and so they'll benefit from it. From my experience, I 
经这个娃也是，呃，平时没有这个转经过的，是不是？那因为 in the past, I don't usually turn the Dharma wheel because in the past in Tibet, people only see the turning of this Dharma wheel as actions done by the elderly, the householders, most young people, and monks and nuns. They don't usually hold the Dharma wheel and turn it in their hand. But Gachen Rinpoche he changed the wrong view that people had of turning the Dharma wheel. In the past, that was once. At the start, I was in Germany. At a Dharma assembly with Gajan Rinpoche, I was really glad that I was able to be part of the Dharma assembly. And at the time, Gajan Rinpoche gave me a Dharma wheel that he had used before. So once I asked Rinpoche, "What exactly is the benefit of turning the Dharma wheel in our hands like that?" And at that time, Rinpoche told me, "When you frequently turn the Dharma wheel, for normal practitioners, this will be able to strengthen our right view, and then our mind will be able to be focused." On one point, so it enables us to have focus. On another hand, for sangha members, we travel around in many different places, and we receive lots of blessing or lots of offerings from people. So when we go around turning ashen, and in our mouths through the speech, we recite the six-syllable mantra. So. Wherever we go, we'll be able to purify all of our different negative karma, and at the same time, also accumulate merit. Rinpoche also said, at the same time, doing this, will help any sentient being, whether he or she is part of the. The religion or not, when they see a person turn the wheel of the Dharma, they'll be curious about it. So when they notice it in their mind stream, there will be a positive connection. In this way, therefore, you'll be able to benefit yourself as well as others. So I will always remember the words that Rinpoche. Said that day, and that is why from that day on, whenever I have the time, I'll try my best to turn the Dharma wheel wherever I go, whether I'm in the car or walking. I will hold this Dharma wheel and keep turning it. This is also the same as the practice of Guru Yoga. The other day, I've said that the practice of Guru Yoga means. We learn whatever it is that the guru does, and we'll follow his practices and do the practices. So this is actually part of the content of the practice of guru yoga. So because of Rinpoche, Rinpoche's actions. 
whether people are in the West or in the East, there are many of Rinpoche's disciples who hold the Dharma wheel and turn it continuously. So whenever you see a person who is holding a Dharma wheel and turning it, you'll be able to guess that, oh, he or she is Gachin Rinpoche's disciple. So in this way, we'll be able to benefit ourselves as well as others. Whenever we sit and have nothing to do, we've got to turn the wheel to Dharma. If we don't turn the wheel to Dharma, it's meaningless, right? So the moment we pick up the Dharma wheel and we're able to continuously turn the Dharma wheel, then we'll continuously accumulate merit and purify our negative karma. That's the meaning of this. The next line, by holding a begging bowl filled with nectar in his left hand, he heals the disease of afflictions of sentient beings. In his left hand, he's holding a begging bowl. In the past, Buddha Shakyamuni, during that time, all of the monastics will hold or use a begging bowl. At that time, the Buddha used the begging bowl to get offerings from the sponsors or to have positive connections with them. So other people will make offerings by placing them in the begging bowl for the Buddha and the monastics. So over here, when we visualize the guru holding a begging bowl, it means that the guru is following on the path of the Buddha, practicing the same way. And so the path of Buddhahood can continue on. So this is how I understand this. And there's also a way to encourage us. Yesterday I said that the guru is constantly in clarity and emptiness. He is uncontrived, but in order to liberate sentient beings, he manifests in different forms. And these forms serve as a kind of encouragement for us in our path. For instance, in the Buddha Dharma teachings, there are the, the eight paths, so one of them, the Noble Eightfold Path, and one of them is the Right Livelihood. So the Right Livelihood means we should not use any negative means to, to live. We have got to have the Right Livelihood. Therefore, our life has to be really pure and clean. Why is it that the, the Buddha has got to hold a begging bowl and to get the offerings from the disciples, it represents that he is liberated, he is free, that each day all he needs is just a little bit. So when he goes in front of a person and is holding out the begging bowl, it also means that he is completely free from pride. So in this way, it helps us to purify our feelings of pride. For instance, the Buddha Shakyamuni, if he were a householder, he's, he was a prince, royalty. He was the son of a king. At a time in India, from their points of view, how is it possible that a prince would go in front of a person with a begging bowl? So why then would he do such a thing? It is so as to purify the feelings of pride. At the same time, he's also able to benefit other sentient beings by forming a positive connection with other sentient beings. Then he's able to plan a positive route with others 
at the same time. When he received the offerings from others, he has got to give some kind of teaching. Through the Dharma teaching, he expresses that gratitude. And at the end, he makes dedication. So, at every moment in our daily lives, there is the Buddha Dharma. So, for the Buddha, even when it comes to a meal time, he's able to purify afflictions. And he's able to develop a positive habit and to purify negativities at the same time, form positive connections with sentient beings and also give them teachings that would transform sentient beings so that they are able to be on the path of liberation. So over here, Gajan Rinpoche is holding a begging bowl. And what it means from my perspective is to understand it in the, that way. So we have got to be steadfast in following Buddha Shakyamuni's path. But ever forget sentient beings and always be filled with compassion for sentient beings. So it says here that the begging bowl is filled with nectar. So this is just a symbol. In actual fact, it may not be like this. So usually we talk about nectar or like some dharma pills and offering to people. So this is just a skillful means, like objects of blessings for others. But what exactly is the kind of illness that sentient beings suffer from. There are two kinds. One is the disease that affects the body. The other is the disease that affects the mind. Diseases that affects our body, well, we will have to rely on doctors and medicine to cure us. But for the disease of afflictions, for the disease of the mind, only our Guru's teachings and the Buddha's Dharma teachings can cure us of our disease of afflictions. That is how I understand this. The next two lines. At its navel on the sun disk is a white luminous home. The light radiating from it invites the Buddhas of the three times. Similar to what we talked about yesterday. Our mind in the form of the Guru. Navel center. We talked about the four chakras. So we have the navel, and then we have the chest, we have the throat, and then we have the, the head. So over here, we're talking about a navel chakra, and we visualize a sun disk there, and on top of the sun disk is a white luminous hum. So visualize a white luminous hum, and that light radiates out. What this means is that at the navel is where the Vajra Yogini and it's also where when we're practicing Tumu and it represents emptiness and on top of that is a white white spot that represents great bliss. So that is the union of the great bliss and emptiness. That is how I understand this. I'm not sure whether that's accurate or not. 
So that's how I understand this. The union of great bliss and emptiness. That is what this lots of white light radiates from the white home syllable. Sometimes the explanation of the home syllable, it says that within the syllable there are the five wisdoms. The thing is, all manifestations is the manifestation of the nature of our mind, which is empty and clear. The light that radiates from the Hung syllable invites the Buddhas of the three times. The Buddhas from the past, present, and future. All of the three times are invited over here. Then what happens? The next line, who descend like snowflakes in the blizzard and dissolve into him. Thus, I see him as the embodiment of the Buddhas of the three times. In our visualization, we visualize the Buddhas from all the ten directions in the form of light or in all kinds of different forms of the Buddhas of the three times, and they melt into us or dissolve into the in, dissolve into us, dissolves, then it dissolves into the white hum. Therefore, the white home syllable that we visualize can be said to be the embodiment of the Buddhas of the three times. So, that sums up the visualization that we're supposed to make. And as for the meaning of this visualization, they are really based on my understanding, my thoughts, and that is why I shared it with you. The next part is the seven limb offering. You are Chinrizi, embodiment of kindness and compassion. You are Tara herself, for you love all beings like a mother loves her child. O Lord of an ocean of mandalas, I supplicate you, glorious Garchin. That is the supplication. In the past, when I was in Lapchi that year, uh, it was because of really precious conditions that come together. And Garchin Rinpoche also came to Lapchi. And at a time, Gachin Rinpoche gave all the retreatants in the mountain lots of Dharma teachings, especially the Ganges Mahamudra teaching. He gave us teachings and he he transmitted that to us. And it's very beneficial for us. At a time, Gachin Rinpoche explained to us the meaning of the seven limb offering. So at that time, I thought I wanted to offer the seven limb offering to Rinpoche. That is based on my feelings that I wanted to offer the seven limb offering to Rinpoche. I really feel that Gachin Rinpoche's compassion is no different from Tara's. He is Tara herself. Tara is also the embodiment of the compassion of all of the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas. It's also the embodiment of the kindness and compassion of Tara. It's no different from Tara. 
And so we see the Guru as a Tara who is alive right in front of us. So the line that says that Tara herself and her love for all beings like a mother loves a child, this is from my personal experience. Gachi Rinpoche, no matter which sentient being or what sentient being he sees, and no matter who he is, how, how, how high, how low, how old or how young the, the people he meet are, Gachi Rinpoche, the way he treats other sentient beings is the same as a mother who treats her own child. To me, a guru who has who is like Gachen Rinpoche, who loves sentient beings so much, it's really rare. So in my mind, when I think of that, I would be using Tara as an analogy for Gachen Rinpoche and his love for sentient beings. So at that time, why is it that I wanted to learn the practice of Tara? When I was doing retreat in Lakchi, I had a dream. And in my dream, I saw Gachen Rinpoche. And and he was on top of a mountain. And on top of the mountain, there is the a great copper, copper Vajra Yogini statue. And there, there's also another great statue of the Tara. So at that time, in my dream, I saw that. Gajan Pache and Bajra Yogini. Then I thought about it. Gajan Rinpoche had been said to be the manifestation of Tara as well as Vajra Yogini's manifestation. So as an ordinary being, we often you know, fabricate things. So at that time, I chose. Because Vajra Yogini sometimes have, has the wrathful kind of form. And Tara, especially the white Tara, always expresses loving kindness and compassion. And that is why I use the white Tara form to, to practice. And in the next line, it says, All pervasive Vajra Tara, Lord of an ocean of mandalas. Usually in the Vajrayana practices, we would receive empowerment, oral transmission, and teachings. So then that will be the guru who possesses these three merits. And that guru will be the same as Vajradhara. And he is the lord of an ocean of all the mandalas. I myself have received many empowerments from Rinpoche as well as oral transmissions and especially teachings on the nature of mind, on the Mahamudra. So for me, Rinpoche possesses all of these three merits. So he is, to me, the same as Vajradhara. He will be no, he's no different from Vajradhara, and I supplicate to him in this way. In the next slide, Sorry, next, the seven limb offering. Usually in the king of aspirations, there is also the seven limb offering. There are many liturgies that have the seven limb offering on it. Therefore, the seven limb offering it is a way to accumulate merit, a way for us to accumulate merit 
and also to purify our negative, negative karma. And we'll be able to purify all kinds of afflictions within our mind stream. So for a practitioner that is training the mind, this is extremely important. So we've got to continually practice. When I say that this is a very important practice, I don't mean to say that every day we've got to recite the words many, many times. That's not what I mean. What I mean is that we've got to recognize the function, the benefits of the seven limb offering. And once we're very clear about the benefits of this seven limb offering, then it'll be it'll be very beneficial for our practice. That is it for today's teaching. Tomorrow, we will start from the seven limb offering and we'll talk in more details about the seven limb offering. Today, what I have done is share with you my thoughts. Thank you all.